more information of, of what's behind this qualitative information about this visual representation. You also have the numbers there and you can generate tables and you can generate the statistics and a lot of things. So I think we think that that's one of the best uh, assets of Parabell that you can combine visual and, and numeric information and basically customize the configurations and visualizations and, and generate and visualize the data in the way that you prefer. Well, the trace that we are going to use in this hands-on session was obtained from a small execution of the Harmony weather forecast model, so this atmospheric composition uh, modeling system, and it was run in the ASIM WMFs uh, Cray XC40 system. So this is a, a Intel machine in the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, and this is using Broadwell chips. Uh, it, it was using uh, 285 MPA processes and with open MPA, as I said previously. So, in order to make the work and, and the visualization simpler, you can we, uh, we only generated the trace using uh, MPA information. And well, I think that with the MPA information and also all the counters for the com the computation side, it's enough for introduction into the session. So, well, I'm, we are going to, 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 to remind a, a little bit what is a trace. So a trace contains uh, all of this information for the model execution, and it's, it's a physical file that, that you may have in your file system. So for this hands-on session, we provide this, this trace for the Harmony model. And this trace is made up from three, three different files. So these three different files made up a trace, and you need to have these three files that are automatically generated with extra. Aid. So everything is there when you generate the, the trace. So, okay, uh, you have first, uh, well, this is a type of here, this should be the PRB, not PCF. So the trace data is in the PRB file. So I'm going to, to go to my terminal so you can see better. So, well, this is the, the trace that you should have in your virtual machine in the folder for this session. And as you see, there are three files there. Well, by looking at the size of these files, you can see that the, the PRB file takes 86 megabytes. So well, it's easy to, to, to figure out that this is the data. So, well, it's better to not open this with a, with a, with a, uh, text editor because, well, it's a, a lot of data. And this is the file that should actually be, be open with Parabell. Okay, the second file is the PCF. Well, this is very important because this is metadata of this uh, data trace. And it contains for, well, our main interest is on the types of performance events in the trace. So you can actually open this file using a text editor. And what you can see here is well, what kind of data the, the, the trace contains. So for example, if you are trying to get uh, events or states of a given type and you don't find them here, is that something went wrong when the uh, trace was generated, for example. You can see here, event type, we have here MPI point-to-point -point information. If you think that you are instrumenting MPA information, you don't have these seven types here. Is that something went wrong? Because you are not going to have this data in your PRB and Parabell is not going to be able to visualize this information. The same for collective, other, and these are well, also very important. Uh, sorry, no, it's a, the Puppy counter. So the Puppy is a, a library that is universal in, in, in the HPC to, to get metrics from the computational part of the applications and well these are among the most commons that we use for for instrumenting applications so the, the total instructions it's useful to, to know what, how many instructions the process the processes have completed in a in a certain amount of time the cycles by the cpu that the cpu has done during this time uh, uh, double precision floating point operations vectoring vector operations Cache misses, we look for the L3, the level three cache misses because they are the most, the most important and the ones that are penalizing more of the model execution. And that's all. So, well, 
in fact, with only these uh, six counters, we, with five counters, sorry, we're going to do a lot of things. Okay, and finally, there is a row. Well, this is important, but we're not going to look at it because it's the IDs of the MPA process, so not, it's important for Paraver, but it's a file, sorry, this file is more or less always the same. You only know how many processes you use it for, for your instrumentation. Well, it's important to clarify that besides you can see the word threads here uh, when it's point one is referring to the main process, the main MPI processes. So we are going to talk about the MPI processes, which is the intermediate number here, 285, 254, and so on. Okay. So now we are going to go to the first step, which is opening the parallel to so for this, you should navigate into the Paraver directory. So this directory is there inside the, the, the folder for this session. And open it by running the binary, which is inside the bin folder, uh, with an upper sign at the end if you want to free your the terminal that you're using. And a Paraver window such as this should pop up. So I recommend you to open it and, and verify that you can open Paraver. So, well, I already opened it before the session, and this is what you should see here. So, in fact, you should start seeing the, your your folder structure here. But okay, once that file is open, well, we can remind that there are some besides uh, doing visualizations, watching the information. There are also tools to handle this information. Mario already explained it part of this, so. This is for you to know that in case a trace is very big, we say that it's very big. Uh, generally, when it is bigger than one gigabyte, it might be cut and filtered to make it manageable with Paraver. So we usually, what we do is to uh, filter the trace. So we get a, a minimum size trace with all the duration that we are getting. And then use this filter trace to cut only the time steps that we want. But, um, but but we're cutting the trace with all the information. And then once you have a reduced version with only a couple of steps, you want, you maybe can, you won't filter it again. And again. But well, this is because uh, when you are instrumenting thousands of processes and you're instrumenting different steps, this can be really big. And well, what we are providing you is, we only use it 285 processes because of this, because we want, to make it manageable and that the transitions are fast because this, has, this will be a, a short session. So, well, just to show, I'm going to load the trace just to show how it is this uh, filter view, how you can access it. So there is a, a size source icon and this is the icon that you can open in order to open the cutter or the filter. You can cut and filter at the same time you want. When you cut, you can cut, but you can select the time using uh, absolute numbers, or you can even uh, select in the trace a region of time, a percentage, by visually uh, selecting the part that you want. And in filter, well, you can filter uh, this car, uh, stage, events, communications. You can select which stage you want to keep the running is actually the most important and event events so you can discard all the events for example but cycles and, and instructions okay next well uh, so here in this slide we show how you can load a trace what well, actually i did it but i'm going to repeat it again so there is a file load trace uh, this is the as you can see you can only see here the prv because the other files are metadata, uh, metadata, I explain it. This takes, these are very a small trace of only 86 megabytes, and you can see that it takes some time. And this because every time that you are loading a trace, Paraver is loading all the uh, data from this file into memory. It may take a while. And as I show you, you can also unload it. Because of everything is loaded into memory, it's important to use the unload traces button when you are working with heavy traces and multiple traces at the same time, because if you open a lot of traces, you can end up with some main memory in your system. And this is not a, a, 
this an unpleasant situation. So it's important to only have open-ended the traces that you really want to work with at the moment. Here in this way, you can see a list of the traces that you have at, at this time open. Well, in this case, we are having one. Okay, the scenes. Well, these are recent function from Parabell, and I think we think that is very really useful. Okay, so as Mario explained, uh, with Parabell, you can generate multiple kinds of views, such as this one that is used for duration. These views, uh, we call it configurations uh, because, well, uh, you can uh, customize them, and there is, in fact, uh, there is a file that is describing everything that is going to be visualized here. And these files are customizable and editable using uh, the Parabell tool. And also, even with a text editor, you can modify them. So, well, there are many, many, many of these configurations that they are uh, already distributed with the Parabell tool. But there is a hint section here, which is actually uh, showing some direct uh, shortcuts to some useful configurations that are available in U-Trace. Why do we mean available? Because Parabell is detecting the events that are recorded in the trace and in the hints, it is only showing configurations that you can see in your in your trace. For example, if you are not uh, instrumenting OpenMP, it won't show the uh, OpenMP configurations here. But in this case, for example, if Parabell is detecting that you have MPI states, so it is showing some useful MPI configurations. And also it is detecting that you have some puppy counters such as uh, instruction cycles, and it is showing you some good, some useful views that you can you can see with this information. And it is not going to show other views that you cannot that you cannot watch. This doesn't mean that these are all the information that you can see because there are more advanced configurations, but at least it's showing some direct and basic ones that are good enough to have a, a first glance of the performance of your application. Well, so we're starting to see how to, to manipulate the, the, the parallel views. So, well, I'm going to open one, the useful duration to start with. Okay, so, well, when you resize the window for view, uh, Parabell is automatically rendering this data again. So well, I'm going to, to show you an example. Well, just to remind that when you open a, a, a configuration, a view, it is displayed here in this list, and you can, at any time, bring it forward by double clicking again, or you double click, it goes backwards again. Well, I, I comment this because it's not always intuitive. So, well, as you can see, when I resize my window, Parabell is redrawing this information. So you have to understand that there is a lot of information in these trays, and we are only showing like a summary of this in this configuration. That's why it takes some time to render. Well, you can think that this is not a lot of time, but when we are opening traces of one gigabyte, this may take longer. So one good tip is to uh, de deactivate the automatic redraw that, uh, as you can see, is here on the, at the bottom of the main Parabell window. And if you deactivate this, Parabell will not redraw automatically the window, as you can see. But you can at any time press on force draw and it will redraw. But anyway, there is a cancel button shown here, as you can see, and you can use this button to, to cancel the current redraw and maybe redraw in the at the next uh, at the next operation that we do. Okay, more things. Uh, the zoom. Well, the, the zoom is is of course a, a very useful functionality. So well, we explain it uh, in a dedicated slides because there are actually two kinds of zoom in parallel. So by default, uh, when you are uh, pressing your mouse over the window and sliding it to the left or to the right, Parabell is doing a zoom into a period of time. So it's, it's zooming on the x-axis, but selecting all the processes by default at the same time. If you want to only focus on a particular amount of objects or processes, you need to press the control uh, button uh, at the same time that you are zooming. I'm going to, to show you how I do it. And then by right-clicking, and pressing on the zoom, you will undo 
the sum operation. So we show how it do it. So well, you can see if we only press the mouse and move to the left or to the right, we are going to zoom, but we can see all the processes there. So we have the 285 processes. We undo the zoom, but we also can focus on a few processes. As you can see, we are only watching from the process 18 to 27. We can also undo zoom and we go to the to the initial. Next one, the copy and paste. Well, so you can actually copy and paste the, the, the status of one window and, and show it in another one. Why is this important? Well, sometimes, as, as you can imagine, when you have a big trace, you can take uh, some time to go to the specific timing inside your application that you need to, that you want to, to look at. And if you open another window, another visualization, it may be quite useful to directly go to this time frame and create a window with the same size, the same time to, to compare two different visualizations. To put an example, so we have this useful duration. Uh, sorry, Miguel. Yeah. Uh, yes. on it, there is one question that maybe you can, um, yes. you can solve easily. Can you say how to show the legend for the colors, please? Yes, of course. So um, simply double clicking on the on the window, you do double click, and you will see uh, another panel at the bottom. And this bottom, where well, there is first a tab that is what were this tab. Well, it is uh, it is saying well, well, where are you? You double click in some part of the trace. You will see which time or which duration is uh, displayed right now, which value is displayed right now at that point. There is also a timing part and finally the colors. The colors is the legend. And well, this legend is not the, the best uh, the best uh, the best range for this legend right now, but in a in a in the in one of the next slides I'm going to explain how to regenerate the the color range and how to also manipulate it. But well yes by double clicking you can see the, the range and well you can see that uh, uh, as i think my explained before uh, in parallel usually lighter colors mean uh, lower values and darker colors mean higher values so we start with 0 0.76 which is the light green and the the range goes up to the blue one dark blue that is this number and uh, orange actually means that is outside the range so all, all that is outside above the, the top uh, level, the top uh, value of the of the range is displayed in orange. But as you can hear, it's a lot. So well, uh, you can imagine that you maybe want to have this 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 part inside the range, and this is what I'm going to explain later. Okay, and well, at any time you can uh, hide this 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 info panel and this uh, legend by right clicking and selecting this radio button here this checkbox sorry. and this is also the way to, to display it okay so we were in the in the in the zoom part so well as i go, was explaining uh, maybe you want to study okay what is going with this processor here what is going on and well, we see from the point of view of the useful duration so, What is happening with the processes? So, so, well, we see that this is a part where useful duration. I'm going to, so to, to, to explain this more in the later, but well, useful duration, what it means here is we are going to see in black the parts that are not useful for the computation part of view, and in color, we are going to see the parts that are useful for the computation part of view. So, we are going to distinguish the, 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 the sections in our application that are computation or not computation. Not computation are mainly uh, communication, but it can also be uh, input output. But well, in, in this trace, as we cut a, a time step in which there is no uh, big uh, input output involved, all the black parts are mostly uh, communication, MPA communication, and the color parts are computation. Itself. And what, as we can see here is that while some processes are doing some computation, 
at the same time, other processes are in doing some communication. So this imbalance that Mario explained in the previous presentation is going to be shown here. So not all the processes are doing the same at the same time. So if we want to know what is actually going on in these black parts, we can open uh, the API calls display that Mario also showed in his presentation. As you can see, this is by default show is a small uh, and it is showing the whole trace from the from showing all the time. If we want to really see this particular section that we are zooming, we can copy by Control C or right click, select copy and then paste. There are uh, different, so you can select if you want to paste only the time, paste only the processes that we are zooming, paste the size, but by default, everything is paste. And as you can see, well, we have the same time frame in both windows, the same size, so they can be comparable. And now it is easier to match, okay, the black parts, what, what is happening during the black parts. So here is some black parts here, and that here is MPA weight and so on. Okay, next one, clone. Well, clone is a, is a powerful feature, especially if you want to generate uh, more advances uh, because with Parallel, you can generate uh, additional configurations and views and we explain it and you can also combine two views in another one to generate a histogram. And well, in order to do this, sometimes it's useful to create a copy of the window that you are already, or the visualization that you already have using the, the clone functionality. So for example, if we open this useful duration, we can uh, right click, Press on clone and a new one will be created. Uh, as you can see, every window has a different name, and well, this name can actually be modified. I'm going to explain it now. So, well, we, we are going to the time and semantics scales, and as I was saying previously, uh, well, these scales can be can be handled using using power. So uh, the time scale is the horizontal and the and the semantic scale are the colors generally, the colors, graph, numbers, whatever pieces in system that you use, and this can be adjusted at any time. So how to adjust the time scale? We have this this trace open that we this a zoom, we can do another zoom, and well, we can to return restore the time scale to cover all the information in the trace. So we press right click right and left click on fit time scale. And what we're going to see is again from the time zero to the, the, the last time in the trace. We're going to see everything again. As you can see, we are only watching the, the processes that we zoomed in the beginning. And this is because we are only restoring the time scale. And what about these uh, orange values that I was telling you previously that they are out of the bounds of the scale. Well, this can be fixed with the fit semantic scale, fit both. And we, if we press this, the, the values of the, 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 the scale range will be regenerated to fit express precisely the values that are being seen in this view. So the, the minimum will be taken as the minimum point of the scale and the maximum as the maximum point of the scale. Of course, if you zoom in or zoom out later, you will see other colors in range and yellow because there are, can be values out of the range. I'm not going to do it yet because there is another, in fact, there is another way of doing this. You can see that there is a warning sign on the uh, bottom left corner. And this actually seeing you that there are values in this view that are outside the range. And you can simply press it to adjust it. So this is doing the same as pitch and this scale before. And as you can see now, besides there is an orange in the legend, we have not seen any orange in the in the view because we fit the scale for the take values in this view. So and we can do the same again if we fit the time scale. The same as we fit the time scale, we can also fit objects. Objects are in this case the processes. And we are going to see again all the processes in the trace. Well, now that we went up, uh, 
we are going to see we are seeing orange colors again and this is because these values are above the 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 are out of the scale so we are can again see from the warning sign and now we are seeing different tonalities and different with differences between these values in this part that are were only in orange before and this is because for example this clearer lighter part is because uh, well as my experience in this session these processes at the bottom are doing less computation than the ones on the top there is a clear imbalance here and well this is something that you can see also when you adjust the, the, the semantic scale Next one. Well, uh, well, I'm going to talk now about the communication lines and event flags because, well, these are things that are not shown by default uh, in Parallel but can be useful in, in some visualizations. So first, the communication lines. Well, when we see an uh, MPA call uh, visualization, by default, we are not seeing. We are only seeing what each process is doing at a given moment. For example sending a message, receiving a message, but we are not seeing from which or to which processes this message is being sent or from which process the message is coming. And this can be seen using the communication line. And event flags are useful, well, to show the points of the trees in which there is actual information recorded by Parallel. So I'm going to show it. Open, I open the MPA call. This is showing the status uh, of uh, MPI events inside the trace. And if we press on view communication line, we are going to see who is communicating with who in this trace. For example, we see a line going from here to here, and if we zoom in this part, well, we can see that here there must be a send. We have to zoom more. Well, these are concise, but at some point there, there is an I send. Uh, here there is an I send also in this part. And this I sent is going to another process that we can we can visualize following the line here. And here is where the weight is taking place. So you can actually see who is communicating with who. Of course, this is most effective when you are zooming out a lot because if you hit the time scale and objects, well, you will see plenty of lines here. And well, this is can be also useful to, to see a first well, a view of the structure of the communications pattern in your application to see more or less if the processes are mostly communicating with the neighbors or there is a global communication but well you can also see the, the communication matrix for that and actually this is more powerful when you are zooming and are focusing on a few processes and the event flags the same as i did with communication uh, lines you can uh, Enable it in the view, event flags, and well, you can actually see when there are events on. This is important because, well, Parallel, when you zoom out, is aggregating different different information with the mean color. Well, this also can be adjusted in the preferences, but you can lose information. For example, we are seeing some part in black, but we see that there is an event here. And we see it in black because maybe this is a very short event. So we can zoom. And well, we can see that there are events here, even if they were not so so before. Now we can actually click on the flag to see which are each event. For example, there is an MPI uh, asynchronous receive, no no looking receive, and the duration is 3.23 now seconds. Next one. Well. This, I, I'm going to talk very briefly about this because, as you can see, there's a lot of, a lot of options inside this part. But, well, this is just to tell you that the way to customize your views is to use the Windows Properties section that provides detailed information about what is represented in the current view. So you can both know uh, how the data that you're showing is being handled, but you can also edit this to adjust it to your needs. So, for example, we have the MPI call window, and we go to this section here. And by default, well, we, we see that we can see the name of the of the view, which is the time that we are zooming currently. So the zoom can also be modified here, introducing numbers. We see that which is the minimum semantic value and the maximum. We can change the 
the units of the time to even minutes. But well, uh, microseconds is usually a good metric for computing. We can filter this information. So as this is an MPA call, well, actually the events that are being shown are these ones, and we can see here that are MPA point to point information. And in the semantic, we see well, also this can be edited depending on the view that you are you are using. But can you can also modify how the semantics are being displayed. You are shown the last event value, the average, and well, there, are, there is a lot of it is. Parabell is really powerful and you can actually do a lot of things, but modifying these properties takes some time to learn and so on. So we are not going to focus much more on it right now. And the info panel, well, uh, happily I already explained this. So you open the info panel and you can see the legend, the timing, the duration, and so on. Well, uh, this is also a nice feature, especially if you are you want to do a presentation like this one, or you want to do a publication. So at any moment, you can say the the, 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 the current visualization using the, the save image. You can also save the text in a CSV and so on. And we save image to we'll save the, the current image in PNG or, or JPA format. Okay, we are going to see how starting how to load configuration. So as I explained before, the hints are just a shortcut to the configurations, but there are many more configurations available in the Parabell installation. And we also provided some configurations to you for this exercise. And these configurations can be loaded by using file load configuration. So the file load configuration. You can see the, the configurations that we prefer for you. In the directory, if it's not uh, directly there, you want to navigate to the appropriate directory. And if you open any of these configurations, a new visualization will open. Uh, and finally, I think this is one of the last features. So uh, you can also, these are recent uh, also uh, feature into Parabell and that is quite useful. And, and it's a possibility to save your session. So you have some visualizations already open it with a zoom it part in the trace and you want to save this to continue working later, or maybe to share it with a colleague to comment some results, is actually a, a possible to load, to save your session, to load it later. So this can be done using the file, save session, and load session. So we say you will store your current, even the positioning of your windows, the zoom, and so on, in a file, and with load, you can load this file. This is a file name that you can save it anywhere, so you can easily take this file and share it with any with some, some And uh, well, finally, uh, notes. So the following slides show views of the different configuration files and use it for the hands-on. So now we finalize it with the well, theoretical practical information. And now we are going to go through the different configurations and explain a little bit each one of them to order a little bit the concepts that were I commented in my presentation and my presentation before. So it's more or less half of the of the session. So this means that we can devote more time to actually commenting the, the the different configurations. That are a few of them. So well I, I recommend you to to try opening the, the configurations as I am explaining them. And well if you want to make any question about any of the configurations you can. So well we can start by useful duration. I think we already talked a lot about them. So, well, just to comment again that useful duration is uh, is displaying the, the the sections of the execution uses in computation, and the colors represent the time of this section. So we can see here in darker color chunks or bars of computation that are longer doesn't have any interruption. And an interruption occurs when the process start communicating with any other process. When you start a blocking send or non-blocking send, your process stops computing and it has to start a communication. And well, this is not good for the performance because you're stopping to do productive work. And well, as you can see, 
as you can see in this trace, there is there are very differentiated sections here. So there is there are some sections with communication and very fine computation in the middle. Then there is a section uh, with a lot of computation in a row, and then again a lot of granularity and communication. And what we can see again, as we as we so as we commented previously, is that there is an imbalance here, and the, these processes at the bottom are doing less computation than the other. And this is because this harmony is a regional model. And well, you need some processes to deal with the boundary conditions, and I think they are these ones in the bottom. And so, basically, here these processes are doing another kind of work, totally different than the other ones. But variations can be also be done to multiple things as we are talking about air models. For example, if one process is uh, is in a region where there is more daylight than in the other, for the computing of the radiation, it can take more time. If one process is computing more clouds than other, that in, a, that's in, in an area where there are no clouds. Also, when we are working with climate models and we compute the ice, the ice part, Okay, the processes that are in the Antarctica region or the Arctic region that are dealing with the ice have to do more work at the other. So there are part of this imbalance that we can be easily resolved using some optimizations, but other not. Other are directly related to the algorithmics. And that's why Mario explained it before that also in understanding the algorithms of the application is really important to do deeper and more important optimizations. Okay, uh, we're going also to talk about the useful direction system. Mario also explained it uh, or showed this in the presentation, but uh, we're going to open it and to make a few things about it. So if we go to the configuration and we open useful duration histogram. We're going to see the same information as in the useful duration view, but in another in another format. So we, what we see in this histogram is in the vertical, what we see is the different processes, the same as in the previous view, but the x-axis is not the time anymore. It is uh, chunks of a uh, useful duration. So parts at the right represent uh, parts of the computation that are longer, that are computing more time without interruption, and parts on the left are parts with uh, more, much more granularity and a smaller computation. We would like to see here if the application was correctly balanced, we would like to see uh, vertical vertical lines, and that's why the histogram is, is good because it can help you to see if the application is correctly balanced. And we see that, well, here in the middle is more or less balanced, but at the right, have the higher or, or bigger computations, it is not balanced at all. And we can easily identify this process on the bottom that are doing this work. In, well, this is something that you can also see in the previous view, but imagine that instead of one step, you're analyzing multiple steps. So having a view that is summarizing all the information at the same time and showing you in a histogram, a group by, by the chunks of computation, which can be useful. The next one is the MPI calls. That well, is quite important, and that's why we already we're playing a little bit with it. So I'm going to restore everything. So, well, this is uh, how we, this, this, this view is showing the, the, the events for the MPI states in the application. So well, you can see, uh, if you, if you zoom out and you see the whole trace uh, at, at one time, you can, actually see much information here. So you can see that there is a part where there is a, an all to all. So there are global communications here in yellow. You can see a part where there is a lot of uh, high sense. So this is a part of point to point communication where the products are communicating with their neighbors. There is an a, a part later where there are more of these point to point communications and weights. This big part in the bottom, this big region, okay. We can we see that there is a big weight, but this is not fault. Uh, this is not MPA's fault. This is just because the application is in balance and this process in the bottom uh, stopped uh, uh, earlier than the other ones to do its job, and that's why it is waiting for more time for the others to 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 finish and, and, do, and do the communication. 
and at and the end we are seeing more global communications that again are bigger in the areas that are doing less computation and thinner in the areas that are uh, delayed or doing more computation so actually this time here is an actual time involved in the in the computation in the communication sorry because the communication is only done when all the processes are ready and arrive to the to the market and these are things that are, can be easily seen with this with this view the next one well uh, someone already before someone before asked about about this one so you are lucky because you it is very easy to generate and it is even in present in the hint so going to hints mpi mpi profile you can open it and it is the same as the mpi profile as mpi stats sorry mpi code profile mpi stats is the same so with this view uh, well as my one explained it yesterday just before sorry you can have a a quick view of how the performance of the application is regarding computation and communication. Because only looking at the outside MPI, you can actually know how much time in your application is employed in computation. So we see that 72% of the time is computation and the rest 28 is computation, which is not really good. With the maximum, we can know the communication efficiency. Why with the maximum? Because well, as we explained uh, before, Looking at MPI code, the actual communication time is the is the is this part when all the processes are arrived to the barrier and then it, it works. So that's why the maximum the process that is uh, doing maximum computation and minimum time employees in communication, this is what we call communication efficiency. And the the unbalance is the division between the average and the, and the maximum. And well, so we can see that it is a balance of 0 0.87. It's not quite a lot, but it can be, it has a big margin. These are the summary, but we can even see this information uh, distributed by, by, by all the processes. Useful instructions. Well, this is a very important view, but not only by itself, because well, only seeing the instructions does not actually give a lot of information, but it's useful to for other kind of use. So this a view that uh, that I was going on. You see, is similar to the useful duration because well, there is actually a relation between the duration and the number of instructions that that process is doing. But here, the semantics, the value, is showing the number of instructions done in this region. So here is like five thousand million uh, instructions. And it's useful, for example, to calculate the instructions per cycle that we are going to see now. So this is a useful IPC, which is the instructions per cycle. This is a, a speed measure, so a, a measure of how fast your application is doing the computations and is dividing the instructions by the cycles view. And there is also an aggregated useful IPC that, as you can see, instead of colors, there is a graph. And this is showing the, the the IPC of all the all the processes. Why we say useful? Because we are only taking into good account the instructions per cycle of the computation regions. We don't care about the IPC of the MPI parts because well, a process is, that is waiting probably is throttling and doing a lot of uh, cycles, but it is not useful. It is not uh, computation once, and we we don't care about this one. So if we open the useful IPC, it's a configuration how it would like. And well, something that if we go compare with the useful duration, something that we see here is that well, these parts in blue that are doing more, more work or taking more time to do the computation actually are not the ones that are faster. And this may be a reason for all the time that they are taking. And some other parts here have a, a big IPC. So the IPC is like two, 2.5. And these are shorter in, 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 the, in the useful duration side. The same that these parts in blue that are the ones with a high IPC, I think, like this one's here, 2.60. So, well, 
this is not always like that, but usually when a, a, a section, a region in your application has a high IPC, it is faster and it takes time. It, it takes less time to compute. And I will open also the aggregated. This will be seen. And as I showed you before, you can copy and paste, for example, only the time and only the size. And well, we are seeing a, a different view of this information. So actually here is much more uh, clear which are the parts of the application that have a higher IPC. So these regions here, if the IPC is not very bad, but it's improbable. And, and there's a part here that if they, they actually, it may seem that the, the, the IPC here is very high, but as not all of the executions, the application has an, an imbalance and not all the executions are done at the same time, this is a little bit diluted and the values are not high here because this is the aggregated. That's why when well, the application was uh, well balanced, the values will be much higher in the aggregated. And we're going to go to the to the to the uh, floating point operations per cycle. Why this is important? Well, it's not I sorry I, because I missed say this, but uh, instructions per cycle, even is it is useful duration doesn't mean that all of this computation is really useful because, well, some of these instructions can be load and store instructions from the uh, registers and even controlling functions, control instructions, sorry. So when the application is doing a lot of instructions, it doesn't mean that always is computing more things. And that's why we are also interested in knowing which are the, the floating point operation uh, instructions. So if we load the, the million floating operations per second, now double, double point, we have another different view in which we are only showing the, the, the actual operations. And well, uh, for example, this green part here is not doing as many uh, mega flops as, as this one. Well, so this part really related with the view that we were seeing before. So these clearer parts are slower than these parts here. But for example, here we don't have the same impression as here. So maybe part of these instructions here are a lot of loads, store and all kind of instructions. And of course, we also have the, the aggregated one in which we are seeing this information aggregated for all the processes. And we can see a profile of the million floating point operations in the applications. And we see that there is a peak in, in 2.3000. And this part actually, well, it is not really fast. So this uh, uh, Megaflops uh, view actually gives a, a very good impression of the on the parts of application that are faster doing useful operations. But there is another one that uh, it's useful to understand uh, why these variations are happening, that is a useful L3 misses per 1000 instruction. So that's why one example why the instructions uh, graph is view, the, the instruction graph is useful because we are interested in see L3 catching misses per 1000 instruction. And we are comparing the, because the absolute L3 cache misses is not representative because well, the, the, it is totally related to the number of instructions that we are doing. So doing this derived view and comparing the cache misses per the instructions gives you a more reasonable view. So we are going to open it. And again, we are going to, to do a comparison, for example, with the Megaflops view, copy paste. Okay, so well, we are seeing that th there are L3 misses more or less distributed along all the all the trays. So, 
but we don't really see many, many much variations with this with this view. So that's I'm going to open the aggregated one. And this is actually going to be more useful. Copy paste. And well, there is not always a correlation on this, but we can we can actually see that the parts on the computation that have a certain a certain computation intensity, like this one, they have a low L3 catch value, catch misses value. And for example, other parts that the, the L3 misses increase, they have a, a low. So when the application is doing a, a lot a loading out of data and not finding this data in the first level cache, nor in the second level cache, nor in the L3 cache, it has to look for this data in the main memory. And this is a very expensive operation and may cause the, the, the application to slow down. And well, this, uh, uh, sometimes this is one of the first things that, that you may look at when you detect that your application has some, some peaks and then uh, ballets in your, your, your graph. I think this is going to be the last one, but this is very important too, because we also have the possibility to look at the vectorization uh, rate in, in our application. Why this is important? Well, in modern processors, such as this one that we were instrumenting, the one in the is in the web, uh, there are seen these instructions, but these vector instructions are actually doing multiple computations in one single instruction. So in this uh, one from the is in the web, we can do up to four double precision operations in the same instruction, four multiplications, four uh, additions, of uh, values in a in an array or a, or a vector, and well, this is one of the most important or, or best ways to to optimize your application to ensure that uh, the loops and the operations are vectorized. Vectorization is tricky because well, the compiler has to enable this vectorization and it has to have a clear view that it can do this vectorization and. It can, well, this, uh, it has to add some certainty about the dependencies, and that they are ensured to this to do this vectorization in a in a, in a safe way. So, Paraver provides you with a visualization to know the the degree of vectorization in your code and know the parts that you can actually work to 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 uh, add this vectorization capability. So, it will open the the vectorization. Useful double precision, vectorization ratio. So this is only for double precision instructions. We also will open the aggregate that as before is going to be more useful here. Well, we can see that these values are in this case always between zero and three. So there, most of the regions here. The, the value is close to one. That means that the application is not vectorized at that point because it's only doing one one instruction per per operation. But at some point, it is doing almost three in average. Remind that this is average and and there is some imbalance, so the the imbalance can 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 hide on the information. But we can clearly see that there is a part that is highly vectorized and a part that is not beta is at all, and a part that is partially vectorized. So this is something that you can you can really see with this view, and that, that are really useful to, useful to understand your code, and also why the code is, for example, faster in one platform than in any other, because you may not have compiled it correctly, or may, are you maybe are you no you are not correctly exploiting the the vectorization. So, well, uh, there are some bonus here. Well, so as I explained, it, there are more options in Parabell and there are different configuration files, a lot of them. Uh, but, well, not that all of, not all of the configuration files in Parabell can be useful for these trades because 
as I said before, well, the trace has some information. This information is displayed in the metadata file. And if a configuration is exploiting information that is not in the trace, you can use it. But you can use most of the configurations of employing these public counters that we are using, like sidepoints, instructions, and also MPI, MPI information. So, well, uh, I went through all the presentation in, in one hour, but well, we can use this hour, this half an hour, sorry, for you to, to make questions, and we can also open any other of the views, something that was very clear and that I went too fast, or you can even try to use the configuration yourself and, and ask anything that you want. Uh, I have to say that I can I ask a few questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's perfect because well, the questions maybe are not only useful for you but also for your colleagues or that's perfect, you have questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, one thing is about the uh, uh, imbalanced uh, the computation load. Yes, uh, yes uh, we can see uh, uh, that in this example. And uh, uh, what, 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 what can be the possible reasons for this imbalance? Can we find possible reasons from these figures? So possible reasons for this imbalance, uh, well, so in this particular application, well, Mary knows a, a lot more than I about this particular application, but for example, one thing I know that, or I think that these processes in the bottom are doing a totally different thing than the others at the top. So they are, I think, dealing with boundary conditions, while these are, these from the 200 to the one to the 270 or more, or 60 are working with the data inside the domain, they are dealing with the boundary conditions around the, the area that we are working. So they are doing totally different things. Yeah, Mario? So if you want, Miguel, I can extend. So it's, it's totally true, the, the answer of Miguel. But even more than that, the, the, maybe the, the thing that you, uh, you can know from this particular application, this is a, um, a model to try to simulate the, the atmosphere. So in this particular cases, um, there are uh, this blue color is corresponding the um, um, the computation part of the, the physical part of the execution. So it's about um, it's related to solve in the Gouinier equation the part which is the, the related with the for example with the dynamics. So in this particular case, this model the domain decomposition is done using uh, different latitudes. Okay, so in some specific latitudes, um, there are more physical um, feature to do to solve and since there are more physical feature to solve there are some latitudes which have more computational load and this is the problem um, that is producing this load imbalance in the in the execution so it's, it's as simple as in the in this particular process where you can see this uh, bigger blue line is because they have to solve more feature than the other one so in this case, the, the load balance is because there are more things to do in some specific latitudes than in the other one. Okay, so the idea is you know this, um, and to solve the problem, maybe you have to think how um, you can try to, to improve the load balance when you have more things to do in some specific latitude than in, in, in others. For example, this is uh, something to do with OpenMP, you know, because OpenMP is going to share the the well the, the the computational law that you are going to work and maybe it's going to be um, it's going to help you no with the domain decomposition in this specific part yet it's difficult because you know you have to do domain decomposition with MPI and well the, the idea is try to find how to to solve and optimize this now that you have which is the problem oh, uh. Uh, thank you for your explanation. Just wondering, the, the, the aggregated L3 total miss, I suppose that the higher the value, the more missing, right? Yes, uh, yeah, that is. Mm -hmm. And so the x axis of this figure means, of the aggregation means, uh, yes. 
means what means the the x axis is the time so this is a timeline of the of your execution but uh, aggregating information for all the processes at the same time that's why in the vertical as you a graph the vertical here represents the value instead of the processes because the number the processes are aggregated here but yes the x is a time and the vertical is a value itself in all these aggregated views in all of them okay so from the uh, ipc and the and the mi mi missing we can see at which time step where well, there are problems right yes well in in this case we are only watching a time step because we only cut one of them but yes we can see what what regions or which sections of this time step we have problems and we can see that there is well in some parts there is a correlation for example with the ipc there is a peak here in the level three misses and a decrease in the apc and well we can see this in other regions like here and so well this is not always happening but sometimes the reason for a decrease in the instructions per cycle is because there is this misses because well if the if the in the model is trying to load data from the register then for the cache level you are losing time and of course the instructions are decreased the instructions per cycle decrease uh okay uh thanks for the explanation but maybe another question is uh, you mentioned about some uh, uh, large vari vari variabilities in some figures. Uh, for example, in this IPC, uh, we see some large variations in the yeah. beginning, the later part. Uh, and these two parts uh, relate to the MPI communication, right? Well, so there, there are different things here. For example, uh, well, yes, in part, if you speak about these peaks here, yes, because well, there are some MPI communications in these valleys, and well, the com basically it is not doing useful APC at all. So when you, and you can even see that when the when the the application is well balanced at the points that the computation is aligned, the peaks are higher because all of the information is aggregated into the same point. But for example, some darker blue points here. Where the application is totally imbalanced doesn't correspond to high values here because as well there is an imbalance the aggregated gets diluted and the peaks are not so high but yes between this high peak what you can see is black parts that are communication basically because we are watching aggregated useful apc as we say uh, we discarded all the uh, all the not useful from the computation of same information. You can also see you want IPC for the whole trace, and you can get also the instructions per cycle of the MPA regions, but it is not useful for the computational point of view. Yeah, you may ask any, any question eh, that you want or any doubt. Don't worry about that. Uh, maybe I, I go to another question about yeah, the yeah. about the floating point the, uh, double uh, the, in the figure that you, you shown uh, the, the higher value uh, the better or, or what? <laughs> uh, if, yeah, well, uh, so yeah, we have two of them. So this is uh, the mega flop. So this is uh, floating point operations per second. So with the time. So we have the time here, and this is the million flowing operations per cycle. Because I say we, this is an absolute value, and it is, uh, of course, it will grow if the if the frequency of the processor is higher. I, I mentioned this because sometimes the the, the processor can uh, slow down if uh, it can if the heat is too much for the processor and to ensure that it is not that much the, for example the turbo or the frequency is, is reduces and and this uh, number of operations can can be can be decreasing and but yes the more the more the higher the value the more floating point operations you are doing per second and yeah you will have more, more efficiency 
and the same with the vectorization. This is at the division between the double uh, precision operations and the double precision instructions. So if this ratio is more than one, means that you are doing more than one operation per instruction. And if you are doing more than one operation per instruction, is that you are using some kind of vectorization. Uh, okay. I have to say that the notion I didn't completely understand the, the, the meaning of instruction. Can, yes, can... so instruction, well, the, the processor uh, each time is computing, for example, let's say one, one there are different pipelines and different cores, but one of these pipelines is computing one instruction at a time. This instruction can be load this information from this register, store this uh, data in this register, or do this multiplication between two numbers. But there are more complex instructions that uh, in modern processors that instead of multiplying just two numbers are multiplying four numbers or even eight in, in single position. And this is what we call vectorized, well, these are called vector, vectorized instructions because they are multiplying a vector. This, these numbers, these uh, values have to be in a vector, in an array, in order to be operated. And you can multiply and zoom uh, different positions, not only one inside the vector. And it's very useful because well, if you have a vectorization and has values close to four, it means that the application can compute even four times faster than a non-vectorized uh, application. Okay. Uh... Uh, well, we analyze the, the double precision because, well, this code is working in double precision and most of the operations is a double precision. But we do also, we are also working in converting codes to single precision and we also do comparisons between the double precision and single precision. So not everything is double precision, but as we know that in this application, uh, the, the operations are done in double precision. We are doing using ways for double precision. Uh, maybe the last question from my side. <laughs> I'll leave other people to ask. Yes, uh, go on. Uh, for example, if we uh, modify the code by uh, changing double precision to to singles precision in some parts of the model um and we we should expect that they'll be faster so uh so i suppose that in this case we could see the results from the uh, for example the aggregated useful m float uh float right yes so actually yes you should you should see that there are higher values and well you, you can you should see in almost every every view because for example the useful duration if your application is two times faster which well is very difficult because there is a communication part that is not going to be is it's also improved because the message are shorter but it's not a, a relation of one to two but well you will see that the trace takes less time and if you compare two traces with the same time scale, you will see that one trace occupies this space and the other one occupies much less space. So this one thing, but you, as you say, you will see that the, 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 the floating operations per, per second will increase. Uh, thank you. Um... Maybe a, a little bit naive question. Um, see, in, in in the model, there are several subroutines. Uh, in the profiling, we sh usually we should see also which which subroutine is costing most of time and the, and the, and memory. So, uh, uh, can can we see this information from? Uh, uh, I mean, the computation part. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Is some of the figures. So yes, I, I think Mario mentioned in his presentation, but I didn't mention it in the tutorial as we were not included this information in the trace, but totally yes. So in X-ray, there is a section where you can activate uh, 
uh, well, there are two kind of functions. So on one hand, you can enable MP the color function. So when there is an MPI call, you can see the call stack, the total, the, the, all the call stack of this at the time of the MPI call. So you can see which function called the MPI, the MPI function and all the colors. But you can also uh, develop a list with a set uh, with a list of, of user functions that are important for you. And you can pass this list to XTRA and XTRA can, can, can take the information of the events uh, from this function. So it can, when there is a counter, also it can store which function is is entered and exiting at this time. And you can, there are views, uh, well, I we don't have it here ready, but I can show you in the, what, what, there is one of these views that is for, for seeing user function. I think it was in, yes, yeah. In general views, there is the user functions. And this is the view that shows the, the, the events from user functions. So you can see with colors here, where uh, when a function starts, when a function ends, and so on, as Mario showed with the NMO code, I think. And you can also generate views that combine this information with the side codes. You can, for example, filter this information by function, and you can also see, you can only see you want the, the duration of the uh, computations in one particular function, or the IPC in one particular function, as well. Okay, okay. Uh... Uh, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I'll be yeah, fun. Yeah. <laughs> and you, well, you are, you are welcome to do any question. Not only here, but also you can send us an email and, and ask any question. There is also, well, this we didn't mention maybe, but these BSC tools are open source and well, they are distributed freely in the BSC tools web page and they also up an email and you can ask them any question that you have about the tools. They also have tutorials in their web page where they explain, well, this is a more focused into our nerve science application and, and on the visualizations and operations that we usually do, but they also have some tutorial that you can follow to know about the, the user from the point of view. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, so maybe anyone else has any other question or I don't know if anyone has get anything in the chat. Well, I'm... There is there is one question in the in the chat, which is well actually he he say what is the meaning of total value in the table of the MPI profile about um, well, one that you show yes. Yeah, well the, the total actually in, in this in this one I think is meaningless because it is assuming it is assuming the values of all the processes, but in this part, in this one, we are showing percentages. And when you sum percentages for the processes, well, the, the value can be totally crazy, like in this case. But imagine that instead of percentage, you were watching time. For example, if we look at this at this tab, you can see that what we are showing the semantics is percentage of time, time percentage. But we also can insert of time percentage, we can uh, see uh, absolute time. And this, in this case, it is more useful to see the total because you are see the total time employed outside the MPI, the total time employed in uh, iSense, the total time in all to all, and so on. And this, the kind of things that you can do in this tab. Uh, for example, to change between time uh, or value if you are showing the IPC or changing to the maximum or minimum instead of the average and so on. But that is. Uh, maybe yes. it's not a very good question. Uh, uh, it's, it seems there are also other profiling tools. I use a little bit the uh, G proof uh, uh, to, to view, not really. Uh, can you give a few words about <laughs> about the um, about about your tool compared to these other tools? Well, so yeah, 
there, as you say, that there are many tools and 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 there is a there is a seminar happening every year. I think that I recommend you, which is a BIHPS. If you're interested in performance tools, and, and in this seminar, for one week, uh, a lot of different tools like this one are, are shown, like Scalaska, Tau, Pampir, and well, uh, the BSC tools are also featuring in, in these in these seminars. And well, I, I think that the, every tool has their own pros and cons. And usually, when a tool is more usable, uh, then sometimes, not always, but sometimes it is harder to, to really advance things with this tool. And the other way around, if the tool is really advanced, really customizable, really flexible, sometimes it's not, it's not totally friendly to the user. Well, we have to recognize that Parallel has a learning curve. So the first time that you open a window and well, as, as you were doing your questions, it's not sometimes totally intuitive to see what the color represents. That's what we do in these tutorials. But I think that with the hints that actually show you quick shortcuts to the most typical configurations and, and, and these tutorials, I think it's a good entry point for users. And that once that you enter into Parabell and do a few things with it and you lose the fear, it has a lot of potential. And what I think with Paraver, you have the data there and the tool is very flexible and it lets you do almost anything with the visualization. So what we can say about Paraver is that it's really powerful and flexible, but it doesn't provide a automatic uh, like a analysis or suggestion for you. We know that there are other tools like Inter Profilers that is telling you, okay, your code is not vectorized, you should do this and this. Parabell is not telling this. Parabell is a tool for you, for, for, for experts that know about your code and know about basic uh, computational performance. They provide information and with this information, you must extract the knowledge. Other tools try to give you the knowledge, but maybe are hiding some information that you can use. So, well, there is a trade-off, no? And well, our advice, okay, you can you can try different tools and, and, and use the one that you prefer, that, but we tell how we can apply these tools to do the, the practical work that we do. And in fact, for us, this one is very powerful and also being open source and being more or less easy to install in almost every computer makes it really easy to start using it. It's 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 a helpful explanation. Uh, so I guess that if to uh, re better use the, the your tool, uh, it requires a good understanding of, of MPI, uh, Open MP. <laughs> yes, yes. So it's so I saw, for example, how the, the the Intel tool works and the tool tries to okay run the tool and and it almost tries to tell you what to do to optimize your code but well it, you have a, a really uh, a scalable application with thousands of processes and so on well i think it has some overhead so well the, in with paraver you can manipulate your data can filter cut reduce the data to the minimum data that you need to analyze your application so it's really flexible but flexibility and tiles also having some knowledge and practice and that's why we try to teach people how to use it and also the computational science department is doing a tutorial at the bsc every year only for this set of tools so they teach extra e they teach parallel and also dmas in two three days so you have more time also to to work with it so yeah, it's uh, but as you say, you, you need to do what you are doing, and you need to know a little bit of your application. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, right. Maybe there are no more questions, but we have seven minutes still before the break so you think about anything you can ask thank you miguel for such a nice presentation so we're gonna stay uh, around for about yeah seven minutes and then we
our, our lunch break and we shall reconvene again at, at the uh, party for for containers so feel Thank free you, to yeah. stay around and uh, if you have more questions you can just ask or just write in the chat otherwise uh, we see you again at 13 30. Uh, sorry for, for another question. <laughs> no, don't worry. It's better that we use the time that we have. <laughs> okay. Uh, so for some, if a model has uh, need to be uh, run at the different uh, servers platforms, so uh, does it mean that we need to do the the benchmark tests uh, for diff on different servers? Uh, and eventually different optim optim optimization schemes uh, um, of, on for different servers? Well, so yes and no. So of course, there, therefore, sure will be things about your application, for example, the application structure, the algorithmic, that will be common for all, this, all the hardware that, or platforms that you are using and that you can improve and in you run parabering or XRI and parabering one single platform. But of course, if you think that you fix it, all of these problems or you cannot fix these problems at the time of deploying the application in a different uh, environment, if you think that the performance is not the desired, it's useful to also try to, to run a trace here and analyze it in order to know what is going on. But well, uh, as we said, uh, some things that are structural are many of the problems that applications have are are due to the way that they were parallelized and the algorithmic decisions and this is something that doesn't change with the platform maybe it's more visible in other platforms as mario said you can have some overhead that maybe is a small in one a small configuration and you don't care much about it but when you run when we run with a much higher resolution and with much uh, higher needs in terms of computation, this uh, bottleneck or, or overhead becomes bigger and bigger. But it's something that you can analyze in a cheaper configuration in another platform and, and actually it maybe sometimes it's more easy to do. And you can solve it in the smaller one, but then have the results visible in the, in the, in the bigger one or in another platform. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I guess that uh, uh, the uh, the tools like uh, X Xtro and the uh, Braver uh, are both uh, are extens are extensively used at the BSC uh, for both uh, for the optimization for the optimization of uh, uh, par parallel parallelism and also computation right yes yes that is so well we try to, to use the tools that uh, that are made in in our center but well not only because they were made here that because also because well they they work for the for the for the work that we are doing and well we are involved in many performance projects in our system applications and we are using these tools but from promoting the use of these tools in the community and uh, well we know that other institutions are also using it for budgets as you say mainly for uh, mpi and computation but also for openmp uh, we don't use quite a lot of openmp in in other science code especially climate with the exception of this harmony and and on ifs codes but we know that in, in other in another scientific fields they use OpenMP a lot. Maybe this is the most uh, useful for them for computations inside one node, and it is quite powerful also for OpenMP. But well, it is also compatible with CUDA, OpenCL, so they can also instrument uh, even memory events. So but very versatile. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, and thank you very much for your questions. I think they were really useful.